Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Common Law Ethics and Diversity. And we move right into looking at copyright. As usual, I'm going to share my slides with you so that we can get right into the session in terms of what is and what we should be looking for in the context of copyright. Now, by way of preamble, copyright really it's the right of creators to control copies of their work. You produce a bit of intellectual work, you have a right to, I have a right to control, gets the work and what percentage of the use of work they are used to or they should have. Now, it is the protection of one's intellectual property in the face of unfair and illegal uses by others. And it's also using someone else's work without infringing on their rights. Now, what qualifies to be copyrighted? original and fixed in an intangible medium, works that are original, works that are fixed. These include literary works such as books, newspapers, broadcasts, ads, press releases, and even your own notes that you will make. Those are all really intangible works that are fixed in some cases. Um, you know, that's the reason why professors will say to you, well, these are my notes and you need to acknowledge. Musical works are also part of what constitutes copyrighted work, and of course, those that fall within the domain of dramatic works as well, pantomimes and choreo choreographies. These are all part of what can be qualified for copyrighted material. And then the list goes on in terms of pictorial, graphic and sculptural works, song recordings, and architectural works, among others. Now, in 1991, in the context of creative works, size publications company copied a phone book from rural telephone services listing, and they were actually sued for copyright infringement. And the Supreme Court ruled that the work must possess a modicum of creativity to support or receive copyright protection. The fact that it was a phone book, it was not necessarily something that is creative. It is in the public domain. And so the phone book simply did not possess at that time any form of creativity to be locked in or to be considered to be copyrighted. People's names and numbers are found in the phone book. And so there's nothing that really constitutes copyrighted work in that particular regard. And so what cannot be copyrighted include facts, ideas, processes, systems, and of course, government works. These are all in the public domain. Government websites are usually platforms that you can go to see what happens in terms of how we um, daily, you know, running up the operations and stuff like that. It's all there in the public domain. Very early on in the course, we talk about public records. And so if these government works are part of the public records, then they cannot be copyrighted. They exist basically independent of any individual and are void of creativity. For instance, let me talk about the plane crash. That's a fact, you know, it happened independent of any journalistic work because it's just something that occurs maybe for some bad pilot error or something that has to do with the weather. No news organizations or journalists can actually say, I'm copywriting this particular plane crash. It has happened outside of the journalist who is present there, all right? And even if they're the first on the scene and the first to report it, they cannot claim copyrights. So what can be copyrighted? The expression of facts, ideas, systems, among others. The way that they're expressed really depends on the creativity and the originality of the person who expresses them. So in, 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 in effect, facts can be captured by a seasoned writer who paints on the plane crash, you know, survivors' emotions and of course, first respondents versus a descriptive journalistic report. So that reporter who lands on the scene to write and to narrate what has happened, they can actually say, this is my intellectual work that I have produced as a result of my interpretation in the narratives coming from people specifically about the plane crash. And so it is important that we understand who can and what can actually be copyrighted, who can claim copyrighted material and infringements and stuff like that. Now, before we get deeper into copyrighted material, we need to understand the processes. And so registration and protecting works, these are very, very important and critical to actually filing for copyright infringement. So copyright registration is not required in the United States, but it's very wise to do so because to super infringement, the work has to be registered. 
without the registration of your particular intellectual work, whether it's music or poetry, there is no way that you can claim that someone has actually infringed or stolen your particular um, works that you have produced. And so it is possible to register after the fact, after the infringement has taken place, but it will pose a tremendous delay in actually winning that particular copyright infringement case. So the holder, it might be you, it might be me, you may be limited to an award of actual damages, the amount of money that we've lost as a result of the replication or use of our work or misuse because of a lack of registering and protecting the work in the very first instance, even when it was produced, immediately after it was produced, that is. So the idea here is to make sure that you're always registering and protecting your works so that if it's misused or infringed upon, you can actually file a claim in the court of law. Now, a copyright holder who registers a work within three months of publication or prior to the infringement of the work may be awarded statutory damages to the tune of between $750 and $150,000, all right? Of course, attorney's fees can also be, um, you know, distributed as part of the overall, I would say, you know, type of award that you will get. But the holder has to have um, a registration lodged in the context of the work that is, um, you know, in, in the courts for, for having, you know, been breached by someone. So for the infringement to happen, the registration has to be in place. Now, this is an example of what the, um, I would say, placeholder looks like. And of course, where do you register and protect your work? It has to be done at the Copyright Office through a complete application process. So in effect, two copies of the published work or one copy of the unpublished work has to be deposited in the Library of Congress. And of course, the Register of Copyrights will issue a certificate of registration to the copyright holder, and this certificate confirms the actual registration. So two copies of the published work or one copy of the, the unpublished work, and of course, the placeholder is going to be the Library of Congress. Without that particular certification, you have no case, all right, in terms of winning that, that, that particular um, lawsuit that you'll file against someone who has misused or who has appropriated or misappropriated your work and said, well, this is actually my original work. So there's always need to make sure that these checks and balances are in place as it relates to filing a complete application um, with the fees to the Copyright Office. Now, affixing a notice of copyright, and most of us would have seen this before, where documents or, you know, you go to some place and you're buying and you're seeing some labels there, and it's a notice about something that is copyrighted. Merely affixing a notice to a published work is not required for copyright protection, but it is advisable at all times because that's your evidence that it is actually copyrighted. So it's in plain sight and plain view for everyone to see to make sure that they're aware of their proclivities and they're aware of what might happen or occur were they to actually use the work without actually seeking the permission. It may also lay to serve as evidence in a copyright suit um, that the alleged infringer's use was not innocent. In other words, they were fully aware of what they were doing in terms of the infringement. Now, there are some term limits assigned to copyrighted material. It does not last forever. You know, if we look at the 1998 Copyright Term Extension Act, also known as the Sonny Bono Act, um, also known as the Mickey Mouse Act, it extended copyright terms for work created after 1978 to the life of the author plus 70 years. So we're talking about beyond the person's lifetime in terms of when they would have created the music. And so if somebody comes along now, let's say Rihanna, Beyonce, or another person who comes along now in terms of their copyrighted work, it can actually be copyrighted beyond their particular life, lifetime in the context of what it is they're actually doing for the um, particular instance here, all right? So it's very important that we understand the terms and conditions of copyrighted works or copyright protection and how long those particular terms will actually last for. Now, in the context of the copyright term limits, if the work is actually created by a corporation, the term is 120 years from the date of creation or 95 years from the date of publication 
whichever is actually shorter. All right. So that's 120 years from the date of creation. So like I said, if somebody is actually in the context of a, you know, notoriety um, singer, songwriter, um, somebody who is actually the creator of a labels or, you know, um, I would say particular designs, um, it is copyrighted for 120 years. And of course, 95 years from the date of publication. So a lot of us, um, we may, you know, have our materials, um, you know, it's going to outlive us. And um, this is based on, of course, like I said, the Copyright Term Extension Act of 1978. So those are the term limits that are assigned to copyrighted material. Now, let's look now at the first sale doctrine. Generally, copyright holders have no right to control the physical product embodying your expression once it has been sold. So it's out through the doors, all right? The Copyright Act, however, distinguishes between the expressive content, such as a movie, which is exclusively controlled by a copyright holder, and the actual physical object containing the expression, such as Blu-ray, which anyone may actually own. So anyone who lawfully purchases a copyright, a copy of a work rather, can actually resell that copy without infringing on the copyright holder's right. All right. So once the material is actually out there, there is no control over that physical product. And this is consistent with the first sale doctrine. Now, the first sale doctrine only applies to copies manufactured domestically. These aren't assigned to international copies. And so we'll see that the courts have ruled in the John Wiley and Sons case uh, versus Kurt Zang in 2011 and Costco Wholesale Corporation versus Liga in 2008. Copyright materials that have been purchased abroad cannot be distributed inside of the U.S. because we are talking about material that has been imported, and so we don't necessarily um, we, we're not subscribed to the, the, their types of regulations, so we cannot necessarily breach um, the, the laws. So it's going to be an infringement to actually circulate content that has originated outside of the domestic um, space here called the United States. So it's very important to understand that the first sale doctrine applies to copies that we have purchased internally, all right? And not those particular bits and pieces that we would have imported from abroad. So we cannot resell. Now, there's always going to be some legislation that governs everything that we will do in this class. And so we're moving along well in terms of, of what is taking place right now. There are a couple of cases. Um, there's one particular one that I will show you eventually, but the, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act or the DCMA makes it actually illegal to circumvent digital rights management technology directly. And so this is the reason why you will find some um, persons who are hosting programs on online platforms. Um, they will be um, unable to play the music or the soundtrack or whatever the property is of the producer in its entirety, and they will issue a disclaimer stating that we do not own the rights to this particular music or track, all right? So import offered to the public and provide or otherwise traffic in any technology, they cannot do that. Um, you know, they can circumvent, you know, the, the technology used to control access to copyrighted works. It is highly illegal to actually do so, all right? So you cannot circumvent, neither can you import or offer to the public or provide any technology or product in any technology or product or service that can circumvent the measures used to control access. So nobody can say, well, I have the material or I have the technology to actually play the entire copyrighted song or music or movie. Um, it's highly illegal to do that based on the Digital Millennium Copyright Act um, that was established. So there's no circumvention that can happen without being caught um, in the courts as it relates to the legal nature of copywriting music or material on online platforms. Now, the DCMA was initially crafted to extend copyright to digital platforms and to give internet service providers and hosts immunity from infringement, infringements rather by their users, similar to Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act. And this is an act that we spoke about a couple of weeks ago that protects internet service providers. And, and what the DCMA section 512 does, it's the same as the safe harbor clause, it protects service providers against liability 
when the following conditions are met. First, if they have established notice and take down passages. So if you're watching something and it's illegal and that particular platform has taken the particular copyright material down, then they are protected. If they remove the content when they're contacted by the owner of the content, then they're protected. If they have no actual or effective knowledge that the, the, the material is actually um, an infringement based on what they're hosting, then they're protected. All right. So whoever is there as the internet service provider, they have to take some action in order to indemnify themselves from the infringement that is taking place online. So this is called the safe harbor clause. Now, there are instances when using someone else's work without their consent is allowed. And this is called the fair use doctrine. And the fair use of a copyrighted work, including such um, that is reproduced copies, such as phone records or by any other means, um, they should be for purposes such as criticism, commenting, news reporting, teaching, for which I'm actually doing. In some cases, I actually do that so we can actually teach. And of course, multiple copies for classroom use, scholarship or research. These are not infringements of copyright. So these are actually allowed in the context of what we're doing, all right? Now the fair use doctrine was initially a defense against copyright lawsuits. And in 2015, the Supreme Court recognized it as a right asking copyright holders to make sure their claim does not fall on their fair use before filing a claim. In other words, the Supreme Court was seeing cases where some particular owners of the material were actually giving persons the right to use a percentage for commentary or for critiquing or for educational purposes. In some cases, perhaps they were mixing up what it is they were giving the permissions for, what they were filing claims. And so the Supreme Court said to them, make sure that you're not necessarily coming into the court when you would have given uh, permissions in the context of fair use um, in, in terms of your copyrighted material, all right? Now, when accessing or when assessing the fair use of a copyrighted material, the court will look at several things, four categories. Number one, purpose and character of the use of the material. Is it for commercial use or educational purposes? Is it for transformative use or parody? Number two, they look at the nature of the copyrighted work. Is it a work of fact or fiction? Ideas not protected by copyright. And of course, they look at the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relationship to the whole. So the smaller the portion that is used, the higher likelihood of fairness. If you've been told that you can actually use five pages out of a hundred pages, then it's fair to say that this is within the fair use doctrine. Not if you would have photocopied the entire book and you'd have made those copies available to your friends, then of course, this is really outside of fair use. The heart of the work in effect um, you know, it, it should be small and, and small is not necessarily, if the heart of the work is not seen as fear, all right? Um, so if you're using like the major portion of the findings and that's the heart of the work um, and it's seen as small, but it's not seen as fear, then it's really a breach, all right? So the, the fourth area that they look for in terms of looking for copyright infringements would be effect of the use upon the potential market or value of the copyrighted work. And this brings me back to the whole notion of photocopying somebody's work wholesale. Does it substitute the original work? Are people likely to buy the copy rather than the original? So if you've got a whole lot of copies that are made and they're selling for $10 as against the original, which is $100, then it's really a breach, all right? And does it harm the market beyond the original work like the distributors of the copyrighted material? it is seen as actually being unfair because nobody wants to actually go up on Amazon, purchase the, the, the particular material for the original price. So this person has lost money. So the court is looking to see exactly how the use upon the potential market for, you know, or the value of the copyright work is actually impacted. Now let's go to music and licensing. And this is a very thorny issue that has happened over the years to some very excellent musicians in terms of their materials and their music and their actual rhythm and lyrics being misused. And so licensing music before incorporating it into another work averts lawsuits. If the songwriter, the singer has actually done their licensing, then there's going to be no need for these particular types of lawsuits. 
And so categories of works protected by musical licenses include musical works and song recordings. The musical work, uh, which is the composition of music and lyrics generally owned by the songwriter or a musical publisher is what is actually copyrighted. Apart from that, the song recording or the final product produced in the studio by musicians, producers, and sound engineers. This is owned by the record company, but this is also copyrighted. So a license you know, will be required depending on the intended use for the music. I'd like to actually pause here for a minute to go to this whole notion of the copyright infringements that have happened in the past, all right? And we know that the performance license is usually required to play a musical work, and the licenses are generally play, paid by television and radio broadcasters, musicians and bands that perform original works and stuff like that, venues and, and restaurants. But I'm gonna share my screen with you in terms of a particular case that occurred years ago in terms of copyright infringements happening um, in our very backyard. So let's listen um, to this particular um, issue that occurred. I'm going to make sure that my sound is turned on um, so we can hear exactly what transpired. similarities with fanboy films and of course vanilla ice and he later said that he was not aware but the fact is that the music was actually copyrighted years earlier ice ice baby you will hear the same rhythm um, and so in a lot of cases you will find that um, in, in some instances permission is actually granted in fact some of the rhythms that you will hear in the more contemporary music um, borrowing from those particular songs that went through years ago, perhaps back in your parents' days, um, there has to be permission granted before the person can actually go on to apply the same strings and the rhythm in their um, music and their performances. So that's just an example of one of the bigger cases that occurred. There are quite a few examples of copyright infringements that have occurred in the context of music production here in the United States. Now, I'm coming right back to this whole notion of music and licensing to let you know that when there are outdoor performances, um, when there's a performance that is live, there has to be a license that is required to play the person's actual original work. And so television and, and radio broadcasters will actually pay for the licenses. If you've ever looked at any film production or program, they will pay for the licenses to play the original work. And of course, musicians are the persons who will be singing they have to make sure that they're covered in terms of the licenses and stuff like that, all right? Um, broadcasters or venue owners may also pay to license song, 
know, li license songs individually, but most of them choose to actually pay one, what we call a blanket license fee in return for the right to use any of the music from the performing rights organization's repertoire. So if you are ever in a concert that somebody's actually playing or singing somebody else's music, um, more than likely there has been a fee that has covered that particular venue performance based on music and licensing. Um, when it comes to a performance of a dramatic musical work, such as musical comedy, opera, or ballet, um, the use of such a work as part of a story or plot, it requires what we call a grand license because it's an entire performance that is actually put on there, a dramatic show with quite a few what we call numbers or quite a few scores that are included there. Um, scores more in the context of movies, but when it comes to the, the dramatic work, quite a few music um, musical pieces will be applied to tell that narrative across that particular musical work. So they have to also be licensed to do so. So it's not necessarily something that they're doing at free will. Um, moving right along in terms of music and licensing, with the passage of the Song Recordings Act of 1995 and the DCMA, Congress actually created a performance right in song recordings that are digitally transmitted through non-interactive services. And so what we find happening is that webcasters and broadcasters who simulcast on the web, they now need a song recording license as well as a public performance license to actually do so. Individuals who wish to incorporate a musical work into a video, they need a synchronization license, synchronization license from the songwriter or publisher before associating the work with something else. Um, next, we find that a mechanical license is also required to reproduce a song recording for a CD compilation or a digital download. And so the reproduction right in a song recording has to be licensed from the record label, which may license a work at its discretion. In the case of Campbell versus Acopolis Music Incorporated, the court actually ruled that a parody of a work is considered transformative and falls under fair use. So if you find that there are cases where somebody saying my work was actually used without permission, if it's used for the, the, the purposes of parody, then it's transformative. We did talk about that before. So the case of Pretty Woman by Roy Orbison and the parody of the song by Two Life Crew two members illustrate this particular issue that would have happened years ago. Um, the Pretty Woman story. And I'm going to find that particular one to show you exactly what happened um, years ago in that particular instance in terms of Pretty Woman and how it was actually seen as parody. So let's take a look now at that particular parody and the Napster version in the context of what they felt to be really something that was not um, accurate or rightly reflecting in the context of what they were trying to, to, to do as parody. Even if it is a little off-putting, but we're going to have a look at a particular issue. Um, So that was clearly parody from the original Pretty Woman. And so that's the reason why the court was saying that it was established as parody and not necessarily something that was seen as serious as Roy Urbison's version of a Pretty Woman. Now, in the case of Metallica versus Napster, this particular scenario, um, Metallica sued Napster uh, for actually file sharing service for allowing its users to share copyrighted songs. And of course, the court ruled in this case in favor of Metallica and issued an injunction against Napster, which eventually went out of business. In the case of Star Atletica versus Varsity Brands, now we're coming closer to what is happening in design. 
and garments, um, you know, a star Atlantica's decision was actually to make sure leaders outfit based on the varsity's designs, which is actually pictured below, and the decision went in the case of varsity. So varsity won this case because star Atlantica was actually in breach of the copyright um, of, 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 I would say, varsity. All right. Um, so the Supreme Court ruled in that favor that art expressed in articles of clothing is copyrightable if it meets this particular two prong separability test, separate identification and independent existence. So it must be existing independent of any original work and there must be a separation of the identification. So it was too close because so they decided to actually, um, you know, say to them, you need to go with another brand, make sure that you're not stealing someone's original ideas that has been created for the purpose of cheerleading material. And so again, the aesthetic elements, the court said, must be capable of existing as a pictorial, graphic, or cultural work separate from the garment. In other words, if you can actually draw the design of a garment on a piece of paper, because it was art, the garment is actually copyrightable. All right. Now, we are moving quickly into the ethical nature of things for the class, and so I'd like you to read the cases and watch videos, and of course, read ahead for the ethical philosophies section. So that's it for today. I'm going to close off now, and we will see each other very soon um, for the next presentation that I'll be posting for everyone. Goodbye for now.